Hey everybody, how you doing today? Welcome to another discussion about ancient Egypt. Today we are going to start a new chapter on medicine of the ancient world, which I really don't know <laughs> anything about, but we'll learn this lesson together. Uh, Again, for those of you who haven't been listening to, to this too long, this is about ancient Egypt in relation to the black community. Um, the book itself can be found on Amazon, as you can tell by the title, Ancient Egypt. It's being introduced by Professor Bob Breyer. He's a credited professor. And he will be leading the discussion. I'm putting this information out there because people should know about the black culture, where we come from, and how we got to the point we are today. A lot of, a lot of information has been held back from blacks in America and in other parts of the world and it's time that that veil be uncovered so in this series along with other series on this channel I am basically giving my opinion my thoughts on the information that's available whether or not you believe that information well, that's, that's what we're here to discuss. What's real and what's not real. Each culture, each race of people has their belief system, their ancient belief system, the current belief system, their myths, their legends. So do blacks, so do Negroes. But we've been stripped of that. And it's time that we relearn everything that we were taught because a lot of stuff we were taught we were half taught or it was mentioned but not to the point where we understand it so as a negro as an american negro i feel it's up to us it's up to my community to decide what we believe about our ancient past we need to control the narrative about us and not everybody else in the world. A lot of Greek mythology was based on ancient Egyptians. Egyptian, Egypt being African, Africa was predominantly black. You had some Greeks and other nationalities that came and went you know, throughout the course of, of history. But the people who stayed in Africa, they were predominantly black. And as I said in earlier videos, Egypt, Egypt is great. But Egypt didn't just pop up out of nowhere. Egypt was a combination of different tribes coming together. For instance, Nubia. Egypt used the Nubian bowmen to help them fight some of their wars. So that tells me that what made Egypt great was the same thing that America claims to have made them great. The coming together of people with different ideas from different walks of life, from different tribes, and everybody putting their two cents in. And coming up with a solution to a greater problem. So yeah, Egypt might be great, and it is. And I give, uh, I, I give Egypt its props. But I also know that Egypt didn't get that way by itself. It took people from different communities to pull Egypt together and make it what it is. But in history, a lot of times these so-called historians won't tell you about all the 
pyramids that exist in Sudan, Nubia. They won't tell you about the 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 Kush. They won't tell you these things. They just focus on focus on Egypt and all the gold material that they use in the coffins, the sarcophagus, the cartouche on the wall and all the pretty pictures. That's all fine and well. I ain't mad about it. But like I said, as a member of the Negro community, we need to control the narrative. In America alone, we have done great many things over the generations. Now, whether you like it or not, it is what it is. Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Ida B. Wells, uh, C. Madam C. J. Walker, George Washington Carver, Booker T. Williams, uh, W. E. B. Du Bois, and that's just to name a few. All throughout history, we have done great things, but it didn't just start in America. It started in Africa. And we brought that same culture to America, but for some reason, for some ignorant reason, other cultures were afraid of us. They were afraid of our accomplishments. They were afraid of what we could do because we outshined them. So what I'm saying now is let us be great. It's already in us to be great. But we've been suppressed for so long, we didn't forget how great we are as a people. We have always contributed to America, but we've never got our just due. We've never got our credit for the work that we do. So, that being said, let's uh, listen to Professor, Professor Breyer as he talks on... Uh, the subject of medicine in the ancient world. towards the end of the 18th dynasty now, and I'd like to do one of our side trips and talk about medicine in the ancient world, what medicine was like to somebody like Tutankhamun. What did, what did they have available? Uh, first of all, who were the physicians? Well, for the most part, they were priests. The priests were the learned men. The priests were the ones who could read and write. That was how you made your way up through the bureaucracy. You first became a scribe, then a priest, and so... Generally, the physicians come from the temples. We know this because of their titles. Very often we'll have a title, uh, so-and-so was a physician of the Temple of Sechmen. So-and-so was a physician of the Temple of Isis. So we know that physicians were associated with temples, and those temples were dedicated to very specific gods. There were really three gods who were sort of almost like the patron gods of the physicians. And let me tell you about them. If you know a little bit about the mythology, it makes sense why some of them were patrons of medicine. But one is a curious one. Most of the, most of the priests who were physicians, most of these physician priests, they're called wabu. Wab is simply the word for a priest. Um, it's an interesting word, by the way. It means to purify, wab. And it's a hieroglyph that's kind of neat. It has a, um, a jar and water's pouring out of it and a little foot under it. And that means to purify. Water coming out of a jar, you purify with water. Now, if you want to say priest, you put a little man behind it. Because a man who purifies is a priest. Right? So most of these physicians were wabu, which is the plural of wab. They were priests of Sechmet. Now, it's curious that Sechmet is a goddess associated with priests. She is a lioness. She is usually shown in statues <laughs> as a woman with the head of a lioness, right? So she's fierce. 
And there's a myth that talks about her really being fierce. This is why I'm thinking that it's unusual that she's associated with healing and nice things. The myth is called the destruction of mankind. And according to this myth, the god Ray, the sun god, was getting old. Right? His bones were silver, is what it says. His bones were silver. And mankind wasn't listening to Ray. And Ray really got ticked off and did not like the idea that mankind wasn't listening to him. And at one point, he's thinking about wiping out all of mankind. Not unlike a story in the Old Testament when the flood comes, right? Anyway, much of mankind is destroyed, but Ray kind of relents. But what he's done is he's told Sechmet, he said, you're pretty fierce. You will be my eye. You go to earth and destroy mankind. But he relents. But the problem is they can't turn Sechmet off. She's ready to destroy mankind. So Ray has his assistants make up a mixture of ochre, you know, the red mineral ochre, which is used as a dye, and they mix it with beer. So it looks like blood. And they've got a lot of the earth covered with this beer and ochre, which looks like blood. And they send Sechmet down and say, that's the blood of mankind. And she was really happy about that. And she says, I'm going to drink the blood of mankind. And she drinks it, becomes drunk, and forgets about destroying the rest of mankind. So mankind is saved because Sechmet gets drunk. And, but that's why it's kind of curious that Sechmet is one of the chief patron gods of physicians. Another god associated with the physicians is Toth. And this one makes more sense. Now, Toth is usually shown as an ibis. He is a man, has the body of a man, but the head of an ibis, the, the long-beaked bird. Toth is an important god for a lot of reasons. He is the god of writing. It is Toth who invents writing. Now, writing is a strange thing, let me tell you, in the ancient world. Very strange. Obviously, it's a great invention. It's an important invention. But for some reason, the Egyptians didn't write down an awful lot of things, right? As you know, they didn't write down how to mummify. They didn't write down how to build pyramids and temples. A lot of things they didn't write down. They did write down their medicine, how to do medical practices. They did write that down. Now, Toth is the inventor of writing. And you know, the Greeks who revered the Egyptians, they talk about the Egyptians and Toth as being the inventor of writing. But Plato says something very interesting about writing. He says, oh yes, the Egyptians invented a Toth, the god of writing. And it was a terrible invention. Terrible wow. invention. Now think about it. You're going to get Plato? You're going to get good old Plato saying that it's a terrible invention? Why? He says, now men will have the appearance of knowledge, but not true knowledge. What he meant was, oh. you didn't have to have it in your head anymore. You got it on a piece of papyrus, you can read it out loud, and it sounds like you know it, but you really don't know it. I mean, this goes back probably to the old tradition, the Greek tradition, where the Iliad and the Odyssey, they weren't written down. They were memorized and sung. You know, when you said, I know the Odyssey, <laughs> didn't mean you read it and you remember a little bit. <laughs> you could sing the whole thing. So there was that interesting tradition, even among the Greeks, that important things sometimes aren't written down. And Plato in a letter once said, the highest philosophy can't be written down. Now, and you know, Plato was the student of Socrates who never wrote anything. Right? So there is this tradition yeah. that you don't write a lot of things yeah. down. But Toth, the god of writing. I was just thinking that. I was just thinking that Plato was the, the uh, student of Socrates. And Socrates never wrote anything down. Um... Uh, I think he was in the Republic. You can find that online or in the library. It, uh, very interesting book. It's not always the easiest book to understand. I had to read it a couple of times. I, I still don't understand some of it, but I get the gist of it. Um, Socrates, <laughs> man... He, he he was he, man. He's got layers to him, you know. He goes out with the fellas, gets together, and they 
they have these uh, philosophical discussions about morality, what's right, what's wrong. And Plato being a student, he kind of soaks it all in. But Plato in the what I come from the yeah, excuse me. What I get from the story is that Plato was a well learned individual. You know, he traveled Greece, Egypt, a couple of other places. But going back to the notion that these so called scholars want to keep people unlearned, they don't tell you everything that happened. They don't even tell you the most important stuff. They keep everything separate. Majority of the book, uh, The Republic, doesn't mention a lot about Egypt. It does mention some things. And other books like Greek mythology books will have you convinced that the Greeks made up this stuff. It's it's only until you read certain books that you realize, wait a minute, that sounds an awful lot like hmm, it'll make you think. So I bring that up because some people might not understand what, what the professor is saying. It's like when your grandma has a secret recipe and she dies and you have a family gathering and you're trying to recreate that recipe but something's missing. Everybody can taste something's missing but nobody knows what it is. That's because in our culture, especially with the uh, our ancestors, even like great-grandmothers and the great-great-grandmothers, there were certain things that were taught to us that were never written down. It don't mean it never happened. It doesn't mean it never existed. But the best way to keep a secret is not to write it down. Because if you write it down, sooner or later, somebody's going to find somebody's going to find where you wrote it at. And they're going to try to take it for themselves. So back then, the best way to keep a secret was to only pass it down to a select few. Nobody wrote it down. It was oral. Now, the problem with oral is, well, as the generations go on, Something gets lost in translation. You know, grandma might have said, put three cups in there. You turn around and you put two cups in there. Oh, you don't need no three cups. Let's just put, we just put two cups. Yeah, it tastes good, but it's not, it's not the way grandma would have made it. See, now you, you making your own version. It's based off of what your grandmother did, but you making your own version. And that, that's cool. You want to make your own version of something that was already done before. That's, that's all fine and well. But at the same time, there's nothing wrong with giving props to what gave you the inspiration to do that. And that's what, that's what bothers me, is that when these other cultures get together and they make these multi-million dollar businesses and they're doing this, that, and the third. Oh, well, what was your inspiration? Oh, my mother, my father, uh, a business partner that I had, uh, one of the guys my, my great uncle grew up with. It's always somebody other than where they really, really, truly got the inspiration from. And even if your great uncle did get you the inspiration, where did he get it from? Nine times out of ten, he got it from his father, who got it from Egypt. But nobody wants to comment on e Egypt. 
Because then they would have to admit that the niggas, the niggers, as they say, the niggers had culture. They had their own religion. And we just basically went in there with our high-tech weapons and wiped them out. We stole everything we could get our hands on. We enslaved them. We brought them to America. And their children, their descendants have been stuck here ever since. Pitiful. After, what, 400 years or so? Now, now, they decide, well, maybe it's time we tell the truth. Maybe it's time we open up the history books and, and revisit what was told to the American public, what was told to the world. But the damage is already done. Most cultures outside of the uh, <laughs> outside of the Negro nation, they they think we're pathetic. They have no respect for us. The only reason why they deal with us. It's because money. We make them wealthy. We make a lot of people wealthy. And yet, we got nothing to show for it. Why? Because we're too lazy. We've been suppressed so long that we don't... We ain't got much fight in us. Oh yeah, we'll turn on each other. But we won't stand up for each other to fight against a greater enemy, a common enemy. At this point, I think it's about fighting for respect. That's all. Just give us our due. Give us our 40 acres and let us go about our business. But see, they can't do that because... They done sold and resold and bought and resold our 40 acres to somebody else. Oh, well, we, we can't give you anything because, you know, it, it doesn't belong to you anymore. But you stole it. You didn't get, acquire what you got outright. You stole it. You finessed our ancestors into believing they was getting a good deal. Oh, all you got to do, Chief, is just sign your name on this line right here. And we'll give you all the guns you need. But see, they didn't understand how Europeans work. So they were signing their life away. Now we're here in America. And all throughout American history, you had people talking about blacks like we were the scum of the earth. Back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Go back to Africa. We don't want like your kind. No, my guy. I'm not going back to Africa. My people not going back to Africa. Because you know what happened? You recreated Africa right here. So why on earth would we go back to the continent of our birth. Well, this is the second Africa. If people, if Negroes really did the research, you find that the people who enslaved us made it a point to rename, to rebuild as much as they could off the sweat and blood of our ancestors and then they turn around and they name their creations after African provinces African states African cities once I start learning that I'm like why but see the higher ups the upper echelons of 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 greedy financial people they tend to sacrifice their own people just to make a point 
in order to keep their wealth, they will sacrifice their own people just to keep Negroes from coming to the understanding of who they truly are. And as far as medicine, oh man. Wow. Yes, we've had breakthroughs in medicine. We've had professional doctors, surgeons all through the American history. Soldiers, leaders, generals. We've done it all. And yet, as hard as we fought for this country, we get very little respect, very little recognition. And then when we need help, they rather lock us up and put us in jail for breaking some stupid law than to give us assistance. No, no, no. It's not right. It's never been right. And if they call themselves lawmakers, they want to call themselves the government for the people, well, then you need to abide by the laws according to what the people want and not what you want. Everybody not rich. So I don't know who this majority rules is because the majority of the people is broke as hell. That being said, let's get back to our main topic. He's the patron of all physicians. He's the god of medicine. And there is a myth which explains why he should be. There's actually a few of them. Almost all of it goes back to Isis and Osiris and their evil brother Seth. In one of the myths, if you remember, Osiris was killed by Seth. Right? He was evil. Right? Yep. Evil. And then Isis resurrects him. Right? So she has great power also. We'll get to that. But Seth is still alive, and their son, Horus, who was the falcon, does battle with Seth. Doesn't kill him, vanquishes him, beats him, but in the battle, and this is the medical part, Horace's eye is taken out. He loses an eye. Now, the pieces of the eye are found. But there's one little piece missing. And according to the myth, the god Toth, the god of medicine, supplies the missing piece and restores the eye of Horace. And the Eye of Horus became a magical amulet for health. So Toth, by magic, restores the Eye of Horus. And this is a sign of health. So Toth is understandably a god of physicians. There's another myth in which he actually saves Horus's life. Now remember, Seth still exists. The evil is always in the world. And Isis is hiding her son Horus from Seth at one point. The infant Horus, when he's a baby. And she hides him in a thicket, but Horus is stung by a scorpion and dies. Dies. And Isis starts wailing and crying. And she wails and cries so loudly that it goes up to the gods. And Horus comes down. I'm sorry, and Toth comes down, sees the dead Horus, and says, O oh, poison of the scorpion, come out. And Horus resurrects. So Toth has resurrected the dead Horus. So he really is, understandably, a god of physicians. And this is why many physicians also came from temples of Toth. They were associated with Toth. Later, the Greeks are going to pick up on that myth. And Toth is going to become their Hermes. Hmm. Right? And you get this tradition of hermetic writings, secret writings. Those are writings of Hermes that are lost. That's what it means. So this all comes from Egyptian mythology. It's interesting. Um, now, the third and most important, perhaps, of... I thought. This guy. 
was a badass. He was truly a badass. But like they say, it's it's a myth. However, however, what I personally have learned is that myths are grounded in reality. Thought, thought is the god of medicine, the god of writing. Okay, so if I'm your enemy and I know that in your culture it's believed that you created writing, the last thing I need for you to do is to understand and know what I'm getting ready to do to you. Because what I'm getting ready to do is pure evil. So I'm going to forbid you to learn how to read and write. Your parents knew how to read and write. Your great-grandparents and the great-great-great-grandparents, your ancestors knew how to read and write. But you are my slave. You are my prisoner. I cannot afford to have you learn to read and write. Because then you might cause an uprise against me. Now I wonder, where in history could that possibly be true? Hmm. Nah, America wouldn't do nothing like that. America wouldn't enslave hundreds of thousands of black people and all throughout history to keep them from reading and writing and then create a, a bogus school system of education that really don't teach black kids anything. No, nah, America wouldn't do that. This land is free. Home of the brave. They would never do an ally like that. Hmm. Oh well. So anyway, uh medicine. Now you heard the myth about the Scorpio. Scorpion. However, in modern times, a lot of the of the uh, uh, the medicines, especially when it comes to <sighs> snake bites, spider bites, you know, poisonous, venomous, venomous animals, a lot of the uh, the medicine they use to cure such things is derived from the same thing that <laughs> that causes you the illness. You know, for example, you might get a snake bite. They might mix a little, a little, a little uh, spider venom with some antibodies. Maybe throw in uh, a diff different snake venom from what bit you. You know, so it's very, very real. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's very real. So these myths 